International Steering Committee. And Task TV has done about 30 webinars since lockdown, and uh, we cover all issues that are uh, interesting to our community, Turkish American community, and people interested in U.S. Turkey relations. Uh, we're reaching around 240,000 people now based on our various social uh, social media platforms. Today we have a very special guest, Ambassador Ibrahim Kalun, who's a spokesperson for the Turkish President, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and a deputy on the Council for Security and, and Foreign Policy of the Turkish Republic. And um, very good friend, Ambassador Kalun, welcome to our program. Thank you, Gunay. Very happy to be here. I want to thank TASK for, uh, their, uh, for your kind invitation. Thank you. We're honored. And we have a great uh, moment with you today. Uh, get your ideas, your vision, what's happening. The world is changing fast. The COVID-19 uh, virus has caused lockdown throughout the country in the United States, Turkey, uh, and across the globe. Uh, lockdown, as we say in Turkey, evde kal, hayatta kal, we stay home and stay alive. Uh, and it's been uh, working for uh, communities across the globe. And, um, and as we're staying at home, and I'm at my home now, uh, we're finding new ways to communicate with each other and bring people together. Uh, Task TV is really launched because of this. And uh, the post-COVID world is becoming interesting to us. What would it be like? How will a restaurant be? How will the movie theaters open? What will the prices of food be at a restaurant? Um, how will uh, leaders communicate with one another? It will be like webinars like now. How will, for example, the United Nations uh, uh, Assembly uh, Week be in September? We were talking about that earlier today. There's so many unknowns, but also pandemics and crises have a way of either bringing people together or isolating them? And how will those power voids be filled? Uh, what, will, what do we see the role of countries in a uh, multipolar world that's developing? After the big powers, United States, Soviet Union, we entered a bipolar world, and now we're entering a multipolar world. China's very uh, powerful. Uh, Russia is the United States, of course, European Union. We'll see how, how that works out. Mm -hmm. So we're here to get your thoughts on this and, uh, and have a great exchange with you. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by uh, expressing my condolences for those who lost their lives uh, in the U.S., in Turkey, and in other parts of the world. The number of casualties has reached about 350,000 uh, as of today, and uh, I want to extend uh, my condolences to the families, uh, to the loved ones. Um, obviously, this is uh, one of those rare, truly global moments uh, that we are living through. Uh, globalization has become part and parcel of our lives for the last three or four decades or so, but there have been very few truly global moments where the entire world has been affected by one single event. This is not like say the World Cup or Olympics or uh, anything of the kind where everybody either celebrates or mourns something that you know happens in some part of the world, but this is something that uh, is affected everyone, every country, every culture, whether they had the highest number of cases or lower uh, number of cases, uh, they had to take precautions, uh, they had to watch out what's happening in their region, in their action with other uh, countries. It is a truly global moment. And I think we have to think about this. What, what does it mean to live through a truly global uh, moment where we all feel um, same fears, uh, want to have same hopes uh, for the future, apply more or less same measures uh, everywhere, whether you live in China or Iran or in Turkey or in the UK or, or in the United States. This has uh, a leveling impact in terms of perceptions and attitudes. And I think uh, you can take this as a moment where cultural, political, economic, social hierarchies have been flattened. Uh, there are no uh, privileges uh, anymore. We are all um, in the presence of this pandemic uh, where we have to take measures. No matter how strong our economies are, how big our militaries are, how strong our uh, educational institutions or scientific institutions are, we are faced this. Uh, with this problem 
uh, as we go through this uh, moment. If there is one uh, signifier of the age in which we live, it's probably uncertainty. This is, in fact, the age of uncertainty. There are so many unknowns uh, going on. Uh, they were already there present uh, in our um, daily practices of global economy, politics, culture, media, education, and other fields, in the sense that you know, something may happen in some part of the world may have uh, a direct impact. Uh, on your local national situation because we live in an interconnected world and interconnection even though it's a good thing that you open up yourself to others uh, you call for cooperation and solidarity uh, but it also means that you're exposed you're vulnerable just like you know it's been uh, uh, being online it's good that we are online we are talking to one another uh, you know uh, almost 10,000 kilometers away from each other. Uh, it's good to be connected, but it also means that, you know, we are vulnerable to all kinds of privacy issues, uh, cybersecurity, to which I will come uh, shortly. So if there is one uh, common trait that can kind of sum up the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist of the moment in which we live, that is uncertainty. This is the age of uncertainty. Now, what you do, how you respond to that, a set of uncertainties, politically, socially, economically, culturally, individually, spiritually, religiously, <clears throat> I think will be decisive uh, in terms of determining uh, the decades uh, to come. <clears throat> this is also in sharp contrast to uh, the ideal uh, of uh, the Enlightenment, uh, which predicted a world based on reason, science, precision, uh, prediction, exactitude, uh, scientific knowledge, uh, control uh, of nature, control of social, political events. I think that all has turned out to be uh, only an intellectual fantasy. Uh, we are living in a very fragile world. Uh, we've seen how brittle things uh, can be. Even though we have the highest degree of scientific information, scientific research uh, everywhere, uh, but all this has not brought the kind of certainty that we would like to see uh, in our lives. And that is uh, a philosophical problem for us to think about. Uh, this, this sharp contrast between the ideals of the Enlightenment and the realities of the age of uncertainty is something that is forcing us to think in some other more dynamic, more creative ways. This, in fact, calls for a sense of humility. Uh, we are not the masters of the universe. This invisible virus has uh, brought the entire world to its knees from east to west, from China to the United States. And uh, that actually calls for a moment to think about where we are, how we fit into this world, and what has been our modus operandi with the world of nature. Uh, we've been so brutal and cruel uh, to the world of nature. Now we are all thinking uh, about changing our way of interacting with the world of nature. We've seen in many parts of the world, in the cities, uh, in uh, you know, in big uh, um, towns and other places, animals coming out and uh, kind of uh, reclaiming their rightful, you know, places uh, in, in, uh, in, in the areas in which we live now. Uh, even in the Bosphorus here, you know, we've seen, uh, 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 you know, uh, all kinds of other uh, sea animals and, and dolphins. And, and uh, of course, it's a, it's a moment of... Uh, uh, happiness. Uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's cheerful to see them. But when you think about how much uh, we have really destroyed the world of nature and the natural equilibrium uh, in, the, in the universe, um, we, we realize that uh, this virus uh, may or may not be man-made, but probably we had a role to play uh, in the way things have unfolded uh, on, this, uh, on this particular pandemic global uh, moment. Uh, humility needs to be uh, uh, turned into a, a virtue. I, I do not mean to run away from the reality, but uh, if, if we can have this humility, this humble attitude, and combine it with wisdom and determination, we can certainly overcome uh, this, uh, this crisis. We have heard uh, from different analysts that nothing will ever be the same again. Uh, it is true uh, at one level, uh, but we've seen. Uh, other types of calamities and, and catastrophes in the past, and we have not drawn the appropriate lessons uh, from them. So I, I want to be uh, 
a bit cautious uh, here. Probably a lot of things will change substantially. Uh, the pace of history has already accelerated. Some of the things that were happening before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, are going to speed up. Rise of China, rise of Eastern economies will probably uh, gain more momentum. Uh, and probably China uh, will uh, come out of this stronger economically. But other economies may also come out stronger if they play this right, if they uh, take the necessary precautions, depending on their size, each country, I think, will uh, take its share in losses, in gains and losses. Uh, so I think we should be cautious against uh, drawing um, some uh, huge generalizations or general conclusions from this that everybody will lose or everybody will win. I think it will be a mixed uh, a picture. Some countries will win if they play this right. Some countries will lose depending on the, but everybody I think will have a share uh, of the net outcome uh, of this. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, the current global order uh, will have to go uh, undergo certain uh, changes if you are to deal with the impact of the post-corona uh, world. First of all, uh, the international institutions uh, will be taken to task uh, in terms of how effective they have been in their response uh, to the pandemic, beginning with the United Nations, uh, WHO, uh, G20, European Union, Organization of Islamic Cooperation in the Muslim world, and other international institutions, even including NATO, I think will be taken to task uh, how much they have been able to uh, help the people when they uh, were in need. Uh, we already have this debate going on in, uh, in Europe, for example. Uh, there is a lot of heated debate about the, the very meaning or functionality or uh, relevance uh, of the European Union when a number of EU countries such as France, such as uh, Spain and Italy uh, especially, uh, have been going through these difficult times without getting any really um, strong uh, palpable help. Uh, from the European uh, Union. Uh, they, they are just waking up, obviously, to the enormity uh, of this crisis, you know, putting up uh, new packages of economic incentives, etc. Uh, but in, in terms of uh, a, a larger reckoning with the situation, uh, in terms of what has been done or has not been done uh, in investing in infrastructure, in health services, you know, providing help uh, when uh, a member country is in dire need, etc. These issues, I think, will be uh, on our agenda for some time. The same goes through for uh, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. A number of Muslim countries have been hit uh, by the coronavirus or its impact indirectly. If they didn't have, even if they didn't have uh, high numbers of uh, uh, infections, they were uh, affected by the global economic uh, implications of this. They lost uh, in trade. They stopped. Uh, uh, you know, production, the, they uh, close down their borders and so on and so forth. So who is going to uh, provide new incentives for these countries, for example, for members of Organization of Islamic uh, Cooperation? So I think it inter questioning the international institutions will be one important uh, common trait uh, of, of the years uh, to come. Uh, uh, the... I said the global liberal order will have to undergo some uh, significant changes, but let me uh, just draw your attention to one simple fact, which I have stated uh, elsewhere before. Uh, this so-called global liberal order actually has been neither global nor liberal nor an order from the very beginning. It has not been global because the impact has been very uneven. Uh, the rich countries have gotten richer throughout this process. The poor countries have gotten poorer. The, 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 the discrepancy between the rich and the poor uh, is, is unfortunately uh, getting wider and wider uh, if you look at the numbers over the last 50 years, 60 years. And uh, uh, this uh, raises a number of questions about the global nature uh, of uh, the so-called uh, order. Also, in terms of what gets uh, global, what becomes global, uh, it has also been very uneven uh, in terms of uh, not just economic uh, commercial stuff, but it also in terms of cultural ideas, uh, identities, uh, 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 cultural uh, uh, associations, uh, uh, abilities or loyalties to certain culture and civilization. All these uh, developments have been rather uh, uneven also. 
I believe, and in parentheses, let me just state this very briefly, that cultural and civilizational identities will continue to play an important role uh, in people's decisions, how they uh, define themselves in the world and how they relate to other cultures and, and societies. Um, the first reaction at the beginning of the coronavirus, back in, I shall say, February, the mid-March, when you know the numbers were going up, there was a sense of... Uh, panic and, and, uh, and frenzy, uh, obviously that led to a sense of insecurity. The easiest uh, uh, way to deal with situations like this is to uh, go into the blame game. You blame others, you blame China, you blame Iran, you blame this and that country. But the reality uh, is that uh, you know, we are all in this uh, big global village and we have all played a role uh, in uh, in this pandemic, and we will all have to play a role in coming out of it. Uh, I don't think we can put either the blame or the responsibility or the victory uh, on the shoulders of one single country or one single uh, region. It will have to be seen from a global uh, point of view. But we know that's not the rea that's not the reality or facts on the ground. That's why I said it's really not a global order. It's not liberal uh, either in in the sense of uh, you know equal. Uh, um, uh, or, or kind of a competitive field for all uh, equal uh, uh, opportunities uh, for all actors uh, to play a role. We know what gets circulated around the world, uh, what gets promoted, what gets defined as valuable, as important, as aesthetic, as beautiful, as significant, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not really liberal. It's not uh, you know open to everyone. It's not embracing uh, of all differences and varieties. And it's not been an order either. Uh, has created more chaos, uh, and this is not new. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the global, regional, and global crises, and wars, and, and civil wars, and uh, political conflicts, and military conflicts over the last 30, 40 years, um, they have been relentless. Uh, from uh, the genocide in Rwanda to the Bosnian genocide uh, to uh, the Syrian conflict and Libya and the migration crisis, and so on and so forth. I don't want to paint a very bleak picture here, but the reality is that the current uh, world order is not producing order, justice, or uh, equality uh, for all. That's why our president uh, uh, has insisted uh, on this uh, a phrase that he coined and has been using, that the world is larger than five, that is, uh, is bigger than five. It is really a symbolic reference to the UN Security Council, but it really speaks to the issue of injustices and, and uh, inequalities and disequilibrium uh, in, in power structures uh, in the world uh, in which we live. Therefore, uh, we will have to uh, make some serious assessments uh, about uh, what kind of a global order we would like to have, an order uh, that will produce justice, fairness, equality, equal op opportunity uh, for all uh, as we go through this uh, process. The other important uh, point of is, is the economic dimension. Um, now the economists are estimating uh, the cost of the corona on global economy to be anywhere between three to four trillion dollars. That means uh, negative growth rate. Uh, that means um, probably the year 2020 will be a loss uh, globally, uh, economically uh, speaking. It will require uh, an enormous effort by uh, all countries, and big and small, from the G20 countries to others uh, to. Uh, 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 boost new energy, new incentives into global economy. As we go through this now, uh, the second uh, phase uh, of the global uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, we are now a number of countries are opening up, easing up uh, their restrictions. Uh, we will see how the new economic dynamics will play out. Uh, I don't think they will be uh, as they used to be. Uh, there will be a lot of new regulations, new restrictions uh, within the framework uh, of containing the uh, uh, virus. How that will affect the business environment uh, on a global scale uh, will be uh, something to, to watch uh, closely. Uh, uh, the question of freedom and security will be on our agenda. Again, I, I referred to it uh, briefly uh, earlier. Uh, uh, being uh, interconnected is good, being online, being connected, that's, that's very good, but that raises a lot of questions about uh, privacy, about uh, our security, our vulnerabilities, uh, and we will have to make some uh, choices uh, there individually as well as uh, government-wise. Uh, 
as we go through this period, uh, three uh, things or three areas will be of uh, increasing significance. Number one is biosecurity. Number two is cybersecurity. And number three is food security. Why biosecurity? Uh, well, as we go through this pandemic, there have been a number of different theories and ideas about where the virus came from, whether it was produced in a lab and then you know, put out, uh, whether it, it came from the animals, uh, who produced them, who spread it, and so on and so forth. Uh, there is no end to this discussion. The point is that uh, biological security will be extremely important in the years to come. We already had uh, some um, uh, idea about this in terms of biological weapons. Um, the future wars, God forbid, will be fought probably through these biological agents. We already have seen uh, the um, incredibly destructive uh, impact of uh, uh, chemical and biological weapons, uh, and unfortunately, they continue to be used uh, in different parts of the world, including Syria, uh, in the Syrian conflict. Uh, biosecurity uh, will be on uh, top of the agenda of many governments. It will certainly be on, uh, on our agenda uh, in Turkey uh, because uh, uh, we, we have seen what happened uh, here but, and uh, the potential there for, uh, for both good and evil uh, is enormous. And we would like to obviously see this go through the path of goodness rather than go into the hands of wrong people and turn into, uh, uh, into a weapon. Uh, against uh, our own very life uh, in uh, in the years uh, to come. Uh, as a result, more resources, I believe, will be allocated to uh, the study of uh, uh, biosecurity, biological agents, uh, and other related uh, fields. Cybersecurity uh, will be of, again, uh, uh, greater importance because now we are doing everything online, not just a seminar or webinar, but as we speak, billions of transactions are taking place right now online, from banking to ordering your food, uh, from doing yoga on TV, to governments you know, speaking to one another, from international conferences to organizing uh, uh, protective medical supplies to go from this place to another, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you have uh, a good infrastructure uh, uh, in, uh, in communications, in, uh, in cyber uh, infrastructure, but you're lucky, uh, but the more you do it, uh, you know, the more complex it becomes, the big data, how you, uh, uh, you know, conserve that information, how you protect it, obviously. These, these are uh, some of the questions, big questions that will be uh, on, uh, on our agenda in the years to come. Finally, food security. Um, we have seen how significant it is. Uh, thank God, now we seem to be going... Uh, uh, well, in the, in the right direction in terms of reducing the, uh, the intensity of the coronavirus impact uh, in the world. But just imagine that, you know, God forbid, we have a second wave which lasts for another six months. Or if this pandemic was much heavier uh, in terms of its impact and, and, and spread, and we were in lockdown for eight months, for one year, just imagine what the food chain will be like. Um, we have to prepare ourselves for this. We have uh, so much misused and abused uh, the natural environment. The soil has become so tired, depleted. The air, the water uh, that we uh, breathe and we drink uh, have become so depleted, uh, so tired because of our actions, because we are uh, overdoing everything uh, in this age of instant gratification. We are overproducing, we are overconsuming. We are overspeeding uh, as if this makes our lives uh, better. Actually, we have seen that uh, it doesn't make our lives any better. It makes it more stressful. It, it, it makes it uh, more condensed uh, in, in, in the widest sense uh, of the term. The last two months or so, where we've been under lockdown, quarantine, or other measures, self-isolation, I believe we have all seen that we, are, we can live with less. Uh, we can actually do more with less by producing less, by slowing down a little bit, uh, and we haven't missed out on anything significant. To the contrary, we have turned inward a little bit and we began to think about these issues. And uh, self-isolation should serve as a moment and occasion for self-reflection. If we can turn this into, into this uh, intellectual, moral, uh, uh, social value, then we can really get something uh, out of this. Therefore, 
food security is not just about what we produce uh, in the cornfield, uh, but also in terms of the quality of the food uh, that we get at our table and how we get it from the field to the table. That will be another uh, major question, that is the supply lines, how we get our food uh, you know, in a more qualitative way. Uh, and probably uh, you know, organic food, or organic farming, etc., will gain more significance. Uh, but it shall not be the luxury of the rich. It shall be available to everyone. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how uh, individual choices will shape uh, the market dynamics uh, as we go through this, uh, this process. Now, uh, everybody's hope at this point uh, is that as the, the impact is uh, hopefully dwindling, uh, is uh, that uh, the vaccine will be produced soon. Uh, we have participated in a number of international initiatives as Turkey. The EU called for uh, a, a vaccine fund, um, was held about three weeks ago. Uh, it requires global uh, partnership. Uh, I don't think any country, any uh, scientific institution or research institute can do it on its own. It will probably require the work of many scientists from around the world, from China, from Turkey, from UK, from, I don't know, South Africa, India, wherever they are available. Uh, but that vaccine, uh, when it is found, hopefully it will be found soon, uh, will have to be made available uh, to everyone. It should, the whole process should be transparent. Uh, it should be available uh, at, at reasonable prices. It should not be used as a commercial weapon or as a political weapon um, uh, because we have seen some uh, resurfacing of old racism when, for example, two French doctors had a discussion on TV uh, suggesting that uh, this new vaccine should be tried on, on Africans first. And it's like, you know, in, in the 21st century, and you, you, you see this, again, old habits die hard. Uh, this is really ugly face of racism. Uh, I think everyone should be uh, involved in this process. It should be a transparent process. When the vaccine is found, uh, it should be made available globally to everyone without any discrimination to race, nationality, or economic uh, condition. Um, a few more uh, concluding points, and then uh, maybe we can open up uh, uh, the discussion for uh, comments and, and, and questions. I think uh, you will see uh, in the short run the rise of uh, security versus freedom uh, and uh, uh, concerns uh, over who is going to provide public safety and security my own security, my own personal security, the security of my community, my nation, etc., uh, will probably uh, have a precedence over other considerations. So in the long run, this may fuel more uh, new nationalist, narrow-minded nationalist and populist uh, movements around the world. We've had this problem before. Uh, in this age of globalization, we have this ironic situation of the rise of um, uh, populist movements, uh, anti-globalist, uh, but more so, uh, more importantly, populism bordering on racism, discrimination against other uh, people. Anti-Semitism hasn't died out. Islamophobia remains to be on the rise. Uh, even in countries like India, for example, some uh, Indian nationalists blame the virus on uh, Muslims uh, of India, claiming that they brought the virus from this or that place because of their religion, their religious and cultural practices. Uh, virus has spread among uh, the Muslims of India. You know, this kind of crazy uh, ideas have fueled uh, Islamophobia. In other parts of the world, we have seen uh, uh, cases similar uh, to that. So we all have to be uh, vigilant against this uh, danger. Religious leaders, political leaders, community leaders, opinion leaders, media people, they all have a responsibility to uh, fight uh, against this other virus of racism, discrimination, anti-Semitism, uh, and uh, Islamophobia. Uh, but in the, in the short run, this probably will fuel uh, the already uh, uh, developing and strengthening uh, populist movements. But it will uh, create its own antithesis uh, also. Some also will call for more global cooperation. So what you will see is a mixture of the competition of three forces, uh, new nationalists, 
uh, globalists and the internationalists. Uh, the neo-nationalists in the narrow sense of the term will call for more uh, public safety, public security, uh, public order, uh, therefore uh, strengthening the sense of uh, uh, security uh, at the national level, but it, will, it has the potential to become uh, um, uh, a, a narrowly defined uh, neo-nationalist or petty nationalist uh, uh, discriminatory attitude. The internationalists are those who call for uh, the central role uh, of nation states uh, in the global order, as opposed to the globalists uh, who uh, advocate uh, other uh, agents, actors uh, outside the nation state uh, structures. Uh, you will probably see uh, a fierce competition uh, between them uh, as well. Uh, be that as it may, uh, I think we will see more calls for more uh, uh, regulations, globally speaking, uh, in terms of uh, biosecurity, in terms of uh, cyber security, food security, trade, traveling, tourism, and in all other uh, areas. Now here, um, uh, let me just uh, conclude by saying uh, that uh, uh, the current global order uh, turned out to be much more vulnerable uh, than we thought it was. And uh, the, the current system has tested positive. You know, the, uh, we are being tested every day, uh, besides individuals and uh, millions of people who've been tested, the entire system has tested positive. So we have to think about what to do. Uh, when you are tested positive, you have to take certain measures, right, to cure yourself. If the system uh, is tested positive, then I think it's time to think about uh, what we should be doing more. What should we be doing right uh, to, first of all, contain this, uh, pandemic, prepare ourselves, secondly, for the next wave. If you don't uh, learn the lessons uh, from this pandemic, the next one will be much more destructive. It, it's, it's, it's a simple fact. And that requires striking a balance between uh, reaching a certain degree of national ability and self-sufficiency on the one hand, and global partnership and solidarity on the other. No man is an island, and in this world, no nation is an island. We all live in this interconnected world. We have to develop our own capacities to deal with pandemics, health issues, and other biological or other types of issues. But we also have to uh, be open to cooperation and solidarity uh, globally. In Turkey, we've tried our best uh, in this direction with this mindset. Uh, we've developed, increased our national uh, capacity for self-sufficiency, uh, and thanks to uh, the policies of our president, President Erdogan, for uh, um, investing so much in the health infrastructure, building these uh, city hospitals over the last 16, 17 years, uh, we uh, dealt with the pandemic, uh, I think, in a much more uh, efficient way uh, compared to many other uh, uh, countries. We have uh, produced our own ventilators, manufactured them here uh, with, with uh, national uh, uh, engineering uh, companies. And, uh, but not only that, uh, we were also able to uh, provide uh, um, protective uh, uh, medical supplies, uh, aid material uh, to countries in need, uh, whether it was the United States or the UK or Spain or Somalia or Chad, as uh, we send the last plane today, actually, to uh, Chad, uh, equipped with, with medical uh, supplies. Because we believe in global humanitarian diplomacy. We believe by helping others, we help ourselves. We believe that it's not about how much you have, but how much you care uh, for others. Uh, and I believe this, this humane approach to global diplomacy uh, is something that we should not take for granted. It is extremely important and ever more significant today than, than before at a time when uh, uh, arrogance uh, and hedonism and uh, selfishness uh, at the global level may lead to more catastrophes uh, than the coronavirus can bring. Ambassador Cullen, thank you for going through uh, all the issues in such a concise and clear way. Um, 
we're right now talking about uh, reopening. And a, a, a theme in your talk was balance. Uh, do we achieve the balance necessary as our population, for example, reaches 8 billion on the world? Are we reaching the necessary balance to make this a welcoming world for human beings? Uh, or are we headed towards a catastrophe? Um, reopening in the microcosm of a pandemic, this pandemic, uh, is going to require some balance between uh, economic recovery and uh, public health and safety. Um, in the United States, we're going through this right now, uh, trying to gauge how much we should reopen. It's kind of scary, to tell you the truth, uh, because some have reopened just because they believe the pandemic is a conspiracy theory. And some are saying we have to, we have to reopen because the meager money we've received from the federal government is not going to keep our family businesses open. Uh, and we have to reopen uh, just to normalize and get some money and some food on our tables. Uh, but who's going to do that? We know from the United States, the frontline people are those who contracted the pandemic. The frontline population exchange people were also uh, minorities. Uh, there was a racial component to this, not that a race has a particular vulnerability based on their DNAs, but that poor people were out front making the system try to work. And we had, therefore we, had, we saw that our poor people uh, were mostly minorities or disproportionately minorities were dying from the pandemic. Um, so well, now we're going to revisit reopening again. Are we going to make the same mistakes again? Um, and in Turkey, Turkey is a regional power. Turkey's going to go through reopenings now. And then those reopenings with uh, countries that are smaller than most cities in America <laughs> are, are going to be opened up, Greece, for example, uh, and uh, which, which almost, almost uh, absolutely relies on tourism. Uh, so that was a kind of a long question, but... Can you talk about reopening with respect to Turkey, the region, and internationally? Uh, we have to uh, consider seriously the, the, the parameters, the conditions uh, of the reopening, as it's happening now in Europe, uh, in parts of the United States, uh, in Turkey as well. Uh, we cannot keep our countries closed forever. Uh, the system, the, the, the entire ecosystem, has to function in one way or another. But this has to be done uh, with uh, uh, a, a, a concern, a serious concern over public health, uh, and uh, uh, with considerations to make sure that um, you know the pandemic doesn't come back. We don't have a second wave. Uh, a simple fact of this new period or the new phase, if you like, uh, of the of the post-corona world will be that the new normal will be different from what was the normal before. Uh, the new normal will impose its own conditions uh, as we go through this. I don't think anybody is in a position right now to predict what those conditions will be precisely. As we go through this, um, some other things uh, will come up, some other challenges or opportunities. Uh, we, we will go through this dynamic and flexible uh, process. Each country will have to look at uh, you know, its own specific circumstances as they open up, as they reopen, as they continue certain restrictions, whether it's in uh, the production line, it's in, in food or in tourism or other, uh, other areas. Uh, secondly, uh, we're going to have to learn how to live uh, with this um, kind of shadow of the pandemic uh, in not just the months, but also years to come. Uh, we're going to have to live we're going to have to learn how to you know, live with uh, all the measures that are being taken right now, masks, social distancing, and cleaning, and these things, I think, will be part and parcel of our lives uh, you know, in, in the months and perhaps the years to come. How you open up your country safely uh, is uh, a question not only for individual countries, but also for uh, uh, the entire world as a whole. Therefore, this will require some global uh, thinking, uh, consultation, uh, cooperation. If 
Because if the United States opens up and others do not, or vice versa, uh, you have a disequilibrium in the system because everything is interconnected. Uh, and our economy, uh, if it is to function properly, will rely on trade, for example, on tourism. That means that you know other countries will need to open up, normalize as well uh, around the same time. So synchronizing you know, this opening up uh, of uh, the economies of the different countries around the world uh, will be important. That's why, uh, for example, our president has been um, on the phone with uh, most world leaders uh, discussing this, exchanging ideas, asking questions to other world leaders, when they are planning to open up, what kind of measures they are putting in place, how long they will keep them, uh, what has been their practice, what, what have been the best practices during this process, etc. So it's been a, 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 a very robust learning process for everyone. Uh, we are experimenting with a lot of things and we are learning new things. Therefore, it will be a dynamic process. Uh, it will be a flexible uh, process as we open up. Uh, but the, the, the balance between opening up the economy and keeping human lives safe uh, will be a common trait uh, of uh, not only the few months ahead of us, but I think over the, uh, over the years uh, and perhaps decades to come. Yeah, I would, I would agree with uh, the long-term plan. Uh, our own banks here are doing webinars for their clients, uh, like myself, who lost 30% of our retirement fund, our college fund for our kids, our life savings. And they're now telling us, they're quoting from the Rolling Stone song. They're saying, you can't always get what you want, but if you try real hard, you might get what you need. And which I think is, they're setting out a very low expectations for the future. They, uh, they, um, are anticipating not a, a U type uh, recovery in the in the uh, economy, but like an L, which a flat, which means a flat line for a long time, at least eighteen months. The interconnectedness, I believe, that you mentioned, and the equilibrium; these are challenges, but they're really opportunities as well uh, for uh, helping. When Turkey helps mm -hmm. the United States, uh, that's special. I think, you know, it's um, the masks, the hazmat suits, the face shields. Uh, would you talk more about that type of interconnectedness, it, helping one another? Well, uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, uh, continued our uh, global humanitarian diplomacy in the Corona days. Uh, as I said, we have uh, sent medical supplies to the United States, to the UK, to uh, uh, Italy, Spain, a number of other countries, uh, regardless, again, of, of, of their economic standing, you know, in the global economic order, etc. Uh, when someone is in need, you help them. That, that's what, uh, you know, reason and wisdom requires. That's kind of basic humanity. Uh, we have also sent uh, uh, medical supplies to Somalia, for example. The very first locally, nationally produced ventilators. Uh, have been sent to Turkey upon the instructions of our president, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And uh, I, I remember the moment when he gave us the order to send us ventilators uh, to Somalia. He said, look, uh, check our inventory. Uh, we have enough ventilators for our own uh, patients? All right, fine. Now, uh, if we have uh, ability, if they have the ability to send more uh, to other countries, give priority to those that are in dire need of them. And Somalia was one of them. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very telling that, you know, he uh, gave this order uh, in the month of Ramadan mm -hmm. fasting um, because I remember our very first trip to Somalia with President Erdogan, then he was a prime minister, was also 10 years ago in the month of Ramadan when there was a famine terrible famine in uh, Somalia where uh, more than 350,000 people had died. Uh, and it was really a shame for the entire world that uh, this many people will die because of famine at a time when we are so much overproducing, overconsuming, spending tens of hundreds of billions of dollars on cosmetics, on fashion and, and you know, things like that. 
uh, and you have people in Africa dying. Uh, it's, it's just unconscionable that you know this will happen in the 21st century. And uh, so it was very meaningful. You know, when we landed in Somalia 10 years ago, it changed the face of Somalia. Over the last 10 years, Somalia has come a long way. Um, and uh, people at least have stopped dying because of starvation or floods. We have helped them a lot, and we will continue to stand by our Somalian brothers and sisters, you know, out of our sense of duty for those in need, because we believe that, um, you know, when we help those in need, we are helping ourselves. So we shouldn't be arrogant about it. Uh, we should be humble about it. Uh, as much as uh, you can help, that's good. It really uh, brings cultures and societies and human beings uh, closer to one another. Uh, in, in terms of overproducing uh, how the you know, global economic dynamics will change, um, it, it's interesting, uh, uh, a very famous fashion company, I'm not going to name it here, has decided to have only uh, two uh, rounds of uh, new fashion clothes rather than five per year as it was their practice. They've just taken this decision uh, because after this pandemic, they also realized uh, that spending uh, on uh, uh, luxury products, uh, you know, doesn't make much sense. Uh, you produce five types of, uh, you know, fashion uh, trends every year. The idea is not to create something more beautiful. The idea is to sell more commodities. That's a simple fact. Uh, now they realize that they can do it with two rather than five. That means that, you know, uh, uh, the people are going to have to, even those who are rich, who are well-to-do to spend that money on, on, on expensive fashion stuff, uh, are reconsidering their priorities. And that's a good thing. I think in the, in the, in the long run, these individual choices, uh, hopefully, will uh, reshape uh, the very nature uh, of global economy, uh, you know, other uh, areas of production. Uh, in, in Turkey, we've been self-sufficient. Thanks to uh, the remarkable work that our president has done over the last uh, 17, 18 years in terms of investing in health infrastructure, supporting health workers, uh, providing uh, incentives to our uh, industry, helping others around the world. Um, so we've been lucky, uh, but I know other countries have not been that lucky. But we also believe that um, as a general principle, and I say this all the time, and I believe it's really an important principle, that uh, when you are faced with a challenge, with a security challenge, whether it's terrorism or biosecurity or pandemic, whatever it is, uh, none of us is safe until all of us are safe. It's, it's a simple fact. If, if, if I want to be safe, I want you to be safe too. If I want to, my neighborhood to be safe, I, I want to make sure, I have to make sure that, you know, the next neighborhood is also safe. Because if there is a trouble in the next neighborhood, next city, next country, in one way or another, sooner or later, it will come to your door too. Uh, and you cannot isolate yourself in that specific sense. You just have to care for the well-being of other human beings so that you can enjoy that state uh, of safety. Uh, yourself. Yeah. I think uh, here in the United States, we have a discussion developing on the concept of social solidarity, uh, which is about people coming together, even if they're isolated from one another, but for a common good uh, for the common person uh, and across, across the nation and globally. Um, and uh, if I may, uh, Gunai, what the health workers around the world have done is a, is an, is a remarkable example of this. Uh, they are the heroes of this process, uh, no doubt. I mean, they put their lives at risk. Many of them were infected. Some died, unfortunately, because of uh, because they got infected. And if you look at their uh, gender, age, ethnicity, religion, it's a remarkable uh, transcending reality. They transcend all these differences uh, and help the needy, help the poor, help the sick. Uh, and uh, I think doctors should be really proud of their profession uh, at this time. And uh, even the British prime minister came out and said the minorities saved his life when he was infected because uh, in his medical team, there were people, medical 
workers, health workers from uh, the native Britain, United Kingdom, but also from India, Pakistan, and uh, I don't know, many other countries, maybe Iran, Africa, North Africa. Uh, it's really a, a beautiful picture where you see the medical professionals coming together, overcoming all of their differences, gender, ethnicity, and this and that, uh, and working for the common good uh, of human beings. Why can't we imagine the same thing happening among the engineers, among social scientists, among the economists, among artists, among teachers? I believe uh, in their daily work, those who are really working with uh, uh, a sense of moral responsibility, this is exactly what they're doing. And maybe we should spread this. Maybe this should be uh, a good occasion for others also to think about this, how we can overcome these differences, work for the common good uh, of the people anywhere in the world, whether they're in Africa or Asia or in New York uh, or in London or somewhere else. Right. The, um, as you may know, our, our co-chair is a doctor on the front line, Dr. Halil Mutlu. And he is working. He is working. Really, no doubt. He's working on the culture. And I've had I have many uh, doctor friends uh, here in Turkey. Also, I know how hard uh, they work. How uh, you know unselfish they have been, <clears throat> and how sacrificing uh, they've been. It's 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 really remarkable. That's why uh, they uh, they should be supported in any way possible. Uh, but uh, you know, as I said, uh, the, the global work the uh, transcultural, transnational work that they have produced uh, in this process is, is really remarkable. Right. They are heroes. We will, as a Turkish American community, I know, uh, we will continue the interconnectedness and express our culture in, uh, through so of social solidarity. Um, as you may know, we've delivered food to 10,000 families in the New York, New Jersey region to help them stay at home and, uh, and uh, fight the spread of the coronavirus. Um, and we have received great donations of medical PPE uh, uh, to, um, to provide to hospitals in New York and, and New Jersey and we'll, bro and we'll broaden that. We will be doing a very nice uh, contribution to Maryland the Maryland's governor, Larry Hogan, has run a great state and uh, in a great way. And he is the president of the Association of Governors of the United States. So from our end, I'll tell you, for our, Tur our Turkey-based listeners, uh, we are looking at all the opportunities uh, to be good human beings, to help one another, help, help thy neighbor, as you would say. and. Um, so Ambassador Cullen, uh, if there's anything else you would like to add, uh, we've come to the completion of our program. It has been a pleasure to have you. Always an excellent opportunity to listen to you, get your ideas, your vision. Uh, the Turkish president, you are his spokesperson and, uh, and Turkey is lucky to have you. Turkey is lucky to have this wonderful leadership that looks after the people under extremely difficult situations. Um, and in the United States, we look forward to being a bridge as, a new rela as, as relations take on new spirit uh, past uh, post-COVID-19 uh, between um, Turkey and the United States. Well, thank you. We're uh, lucky, uh, privileged to have our president as our leader. Uh, we are also very happy to have you as our friends, as our ambassadors uh, in the United States. Uh, you play an extremely significant role, a historic role. Uh, because uh, you build bridges at a time when we need more of them. And uh, you are able to translate the realities of Turkey to the American uh, public uh, and also explain the realities of the uh, American public, American culture, politics and society to the Turkish people, uh, to Turkey and the rest of the world. And uh, both societies have had their share of misunderstanding uh, already. I think we, it, it, you, your work is extremely, extremely important uh, there and uh, I believe uh, this crisis, this pandemic, uh, will give us uh, more opportunities to uh, bring our minds and hearts closer to one another, and hopefully some old, uh, some of the old prejudices, some of the uh, political calculations and machinations will be put aside, 
as we go through this and concentrate on what is essential, what is significant, what is really important uh, for our lives, for our communities, and for our future. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for watching Task TV. Uh, and we will come back with even more uh, webinars. Uh, uh, we're looking at some uh, cultural uh, webinars as well. Uh, everyone's excited about Göbek Tepe, our archaeological site uh, in uh, southeast Turkey. Um, we are, uh, as we say, as the Turkish American community says, we are beloved homeland is America. This is our new new home and our beloved motherland is Turkey. And um, so God, God be with you all. Be well. <laughs>